On the AP exam, there will be four free response questions. This video is modeled after FRQ number three, which is about sinusoidal modeling. Let's pretend it's from the 2008 exam. If you appreciate this content, please give it a like. Contestants on the popular game show The Price is Right take turns spinning a large wheel to see who can get closest to $1 without going over. A pointed indicator is positioned at the center of the wheel that is 8 feet in diameter. Point S is on the outside edge of the wheel. To ensure the wheel is working properly, the producers of the show perform a series of test spins. A motor spins the wheel in a counterclockwise direction, completing two rotations every second. As the wheel spins at a constant speed, the height of S above the level ground periodically increases and decreases. At T equals zero seconds, S is at the same height as the pointed indicator. The sinusoidal function H models the height of S above the level ground in feet as a function of time in seconds. There's the point S and this is the pointed indicator. Part A, the graph of H and its dashed midline for two full cycles is shown. Five points, F, G, J, K, and P are labeled on the graph. No scale is indicated and no axes are presented. Determine possible coordinates T, H of T for the five points F, G, J, K, and P. The pointed indicator is at the center of the circle and point S will periodically fall below the indicator and rise above the indicator. So the height of the indicator will be the midline of the graph. According to the diagram, the pointed indicator is five feet above the ground. So the midline is at five feet. Since the diameter of the wheel is eight feet from top to bottom, the radius of the wheel is four feet. So S will reach a high point that is four feet above the midline. Four feet above a midline of five feet will be nine feet. And point S will reach a low that is four feet below the midline. Four feet below five is one foot. We now have the minimum value, the maximum value, and the value of the midline. This gives us the output value coordinate for all five points. Now let's find the input value coordinates. At t equals zero seconds, s is at the same height as the pointed indicator. So at t equals zero seconds, s is at a height of five feet. s is at the midline. Since point s is at the midline at time t equals zero, we need to pick one of these points and designate the input value as t equals zero but I need you to be extra careful at the midline. You can't just pick any of these values you want. Notice that after some of these values, H of T is increasing, indicating that point S is getting further away from the floor after T equals zero. Whereas after other points, H of T is decreasing, indicating that point S is getting closer to the floor immediately following these points. So what is happening immediately following t equals zero? Is point s getting further away from the floor or is point s getting closer to the floor? That will determine which of these points we can designate as t equals zero. Here is point s at time t equals zero, right at the midline. The fact that the rotation is counterclockwise is significant. It means that immediately after t equals zero, point S will rotate towards the floor. So in order to pick an input value to call t equals zero, we need to pick one of the points that is on the midline, but where h of t begins to decrease immediately afterwards. So let's pick this input value and call it t equals zero. Starting at time t equals zero, 
I've highlighted one period of the function. If we can figure out the duration of the period, we will know the input value at the end of the cycle. In the setup, we were told that the wheel completes two rotations every second, but a period is one rotation. If the wheel completes two rotations in one second, then it will complete one rotation every half of a second. That's the period, p equals one half. Since we've highlighted a cycle that begins at t equals zero, and the period is one half, the input value at the end of the cycle must be one half. Half of one half is one fourth, so that's the input value that goes right here. Half of one fourth is one eighth, so that is this input value. We can use the first input value after zero to find any missing input values. We will simply count by one eighth. This is zero eighths, this is one eighth, two eighths, the next input value is three eighths, then we have four eighths, and the last input value is five eighths. Going back to t equals zero, if we count backwards one eighth, this input value is negative one eighth. We now have the input values and the output values for all five points, so we can begin listing off the coordinates. Point F is at negative one eighth comma nine. Point G is at zero comma five. Point J is at one eighth comma one. Point K is at one fourth comma five. And point P is at three eighths comma Nine. Part B. The function h can be written in the form h of t equals a times the cosine of b times t plus c plus d. Find the values of the constants a, b, c, and d. I need you to memorize what the graphs of the parent functions look like for y equals sine t and y equals cosine t. Notice that at time t equals zero, sine t is on the midline, and then it goes up and down. By contrast, at time t equals zero, cosine t starts off at its highest value, and then it goes down and up. h of t is cosine t after four transformations, so we can figure out the values of a, b, c, and d by finding the transformations that will turn cosine t into h of t. Let's build an expression for h of t, filling in the values of a, b, c, and d as we go along. In unit one, we found that the a value leads to a vertical dilation. Look at the parent function. Notice that the distance from the midline to the maximum value is one. Now compare that to the graph of h of t. The distance from the midline to the maximum value is four. That is a vertical dilation by a factor of four. So the a value is four. In the context of periodic functions, this vertical dilation is called the amplitude. We are going to use a special formula to find the b value. So I'm going to skip this for now and come back to it. Let's move on to the C value. In unit one, we learned that this gives a horizontal translation by the opposite of C. So notice that the parent function starts at T equals zero. Let's trace one period of the cosine function on the graph of H of T. This is the period we will use to write the equation. Notice that instead of starting at zero, this period begins at negative one-eighth. So that's a horizontal translation by negative one-eighth. In unit one, we learned that if the translation is negative one-eighth, that will show up in the equation as positive one-eighth. So this is the value of C. Here's another vocabulary word. 
In the context of periodic functions, a horizontal translation is called a phase shift. In Unit 1, we learned that the d value causes a vertical translation. Notice that the parent function has a midline at 0. However, the midline of h of t is at 5. That is a vertical translation by 5. That means the value of d is 5. Now let's go back and find that b value. I want you to memorize the b value formula. b is given by 2 pi divided by the period. Earlier we found that the period is 1 half. So the b value will equal 2 pi divided by 1 half. However, when you divide by a fraction, you multiply by the reciprocal. So b will equal 2 pi times 2. In other words, b will equal 4 pi. And we can put that 4 pi right in here like this. On the AP exam, they will give you an answer box that you can use to record the values of a, b, c, and d if you wish. Or you can leave the answer box blank and record your answer as an expression for h of t with the values of a, b, c, and d filled in like this. Part C. Refer to the graph of h in part A. The t coordinate of g is t1 and the t coordinate of j is t2. Here's point g and here is point j. So this is t1 and this is t2. C part 1. On the interval from t1 to t2, which of the following is true about h? Is h positive and increasing, positive and decreasing, negative and increasing, or negative and decreasing? On the interval from t1 to t2, h of t is definitely decreasing because it is falling from left to right. Next, we need to decide if h of t is positive or negative on this interval. Well, h of t has a minimum value of 1, so it is always positive, including on the interval from t1 to t2. So remember, on this interval, h of t is positive and decreasing. So the answer is b. C part 2. Describe how the rate of change of h is changing on the interval from t1 to t2. In unit 1, we learned that wherever h of t is concave up, the rate of change is increasing. And wherever h of t is concave down, the rate of change is decreasing. On the interval from t1 to t2, h of t is concave up, so the rate of change is increasing. Since they didn't ask us to explain our reasoning, it's safest to give a one-word answer. Just say increasing. Hey guys, don't forget to like and subscribe. But also, if you found this video helpful, there's a lot more where that came from. You can click the upper link, which will take you to the whole unit playlist. Or you can click the lower link, which will take you to the next video in the playlist. See you there.